our uh, keynote speakers this morning, Hugh Wing and Mahanth Joyce, Joyce and Mahanth, I apologize if I butchered that. Um, Hugh is the City of Madison Community Development Specialist. He's got 20 plus years of working in nonprofits in the human services field. His work is focused on supporting youth as they transition from adolescence to adulthood. He was a member of the steering committee for the Youth Employment Network of Greater Madison, uh, a coalition of 25 plus local nonprofits, including the Madison School District and other agencies that focus on youth employment and youth development. Mahanth joined the city of Madison as fleet superintendent in 2017. Uh, after 16 years working in New York City government operations, he's worked at New York City Parks and Recreation, managing vehicle repair, recycling, waste collection, and volunteer programs. In 2012, he oversaw the safety program for a 30,000 vehicle fleet and managed preparations in response to Hurricane Sandy that same year. Now in Madison, his goal is to make city, the city fleet the greenest, safest, and most cost-efficient possible working with his colleagues in every department. You and Mahanth, welcome, and please share your youth apprenticeship story with our guests. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to um, just just quickly say a few words and let Mahanth, uh, Mahanth talk, um, because he really is the champion within the city. He's taken this program and, and really put it into practice. But um, uh, as Jeff said in my introduction, in the introduction about me, I'm very committed to giving young people an opportunity to explore career and uh, college readiness um, and I, I really have made it a career goal um, to allow um, young people to experience things and then if if they want to um, take it the next step so I joined the city three years ago three and a half years ago and um, you know really we've got to practice what we teach um, the city um, has contracts with agencies who we ask to do youth employment and internship so our goal at the city is to practice what we teach and make it possible. So um, over, over to Mahanth, because I think Mahanth and Fleet Services story um, really is the shining light and can explain how we've done things. And then I'll talk a little bit about the work I've done with HR to make things possible at the end. So um, thank you and Mahanth, um, share your story. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh and Jeff. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, this is a program I actually care a lot about uh, personally, and um, it's the it's probably my favorite program of everything we work on here at Fleet is um, working with the uh, young students uh, and uh, training them in a hands-on way that you can't get in a classroom. Um, and um, I did this kind of work in New York City for several years, and uh, we ran a much larger program, apprenticeship, apprenticeship program, in partnership with the New York City uh, Department of Education. And uh, I think that model worked great over there. In fact, a lot of full-time mechanics in the New York City government fleet operation came through the ranks of the high school program, including the upper managers now of the New York City uh, fleet operation. They were high school kids back in the 80s and 90s, and now they've become full-time mechanics and actually moved up the managerial ranks. And now that they're supporting that program. Uh, so we're trying to build that tradition here. Uh, this isn't appropriate just for fleet uh, mechanics. It could be for any trades or any kind of uh, work, uh, whether it's electrical, plumbing, whether it's IT, which is really hot right now. I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to have apprentices from the high school program. So I'll do a quick introduction to what Madison's doing. Um, if I can um, do a PowerPoint on this, can I share my screen? Okay, let me know if you can see this. Perfect. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so a little bit about what we're doing here in Madison. Uh, so the fleet operation has about 1400 vehicles that we purchase and maintain for the city, things that you guys all see on the road uh, in any city, ambulances, police cars, fire trucks, garbage trucks, 
dump trucks, pickup trucks, that kind of thing. Just about anything the city needs to do its work. Uh, so every city department actually depends heavily on a fleet that's working well and that is um, on a good inspection schedule and well maintained. Uh, and I know um, other groups on this call, your organizations probably have fleets too uh, for the work that you do. So this is really a partnership. Uh, we don't do this alone, obviously. Uh, we work closely with MMSD, uh, Experiential Learning, to get this program launched back in 2018. And the centerpiece of this program is part-time jobs that we're offering students in high school while they're getting school credit. They're also getting paid about, uh, it's a pretty good wage, uh, I think it's around $16 an hour that the city is paying them. And the way this works, because it's hands-on, is high school students are paired with full-time mechanics, uh, and they're, do they're working on all of the roof <laughs> out there. This is real experience. It's not just instruction. They're actually doing the work. They're actually changing the oil, and they're changing the tires on things like police cars and fire trucks and uh, recycling and garbage trucks. So it's, it's real work, real vehicles, real experience. Something I love about what we do is we work on a wider variety of equipment and vehicles than anyone, anyone else in South Central Wisconsin. Uh, we're, because of the size of our fleet and the diversity of the types of equipment we work on, we can rotate these high school kids through a lot of different things. They're not just gonna go, at, go work at a Kia dealership and only work on Kias over here. We're gonna work on 200 types of things in their time with us. Um, and so I think this is the elite apprenticeship program for anyone mechanically inclined here. Uh, and be, beyond uh, just the apprenticeships, we also do a lot of other things. We've donated some vehicles to the automotive um, high schools in the area uh, for, for instruction. Uh, we've also hosted a number of tours for high school students to talk about the apprenticeship program, but beyond that, also working at Fleet, what it's like as an apprentice or full-time later in life. Uh, we talk about working for the city government and um, why, why the city government's important, what the city government does, what Fleet does in relation to all of the other city government agencies. Um, we also are on advisory committees for the local high schools and uh, we work closely with the local teachers and administrators, which is why this program is successful. We've built a network um, around these educational priorities. Um, we've also done um, other cool things, like uh, we're buying a bunch of electric vehicles and we are um, working with the school district as well as Madison Technical College and also MG&E and other companies in the area to show high school students electric vehicles, what it's like to ride in one, what it's like to have to repair an electric vehicle. These are the vehicles of the future. I think in the, in the next few years, you're going to see an explosion, so to speak, in the number of electric vehicles out there. If you, if you all aren't driving electric vehicles, you should be right now. They're great. Uh, they're getting price parity. You spend less on gas and you spend a lot less on maintenance and other things. And these high school kids will probably be working a lot on electric cars, pickup trucks, semi-trailers in their future if they stay in this. So we're giving them the first taste of electric vehicles, get, giving them rides and uh, showing them what's under the hood, how, uh, what a charging station is, that kind of thing. Okay, so uh, we also have our own agenda. This isn't just a charity for the kids. Obviously, we're, we have selfish interests here. We're building a pipeline for our future. Uh, this is an industry that's desperate for skilled employees. Uh, these are good paying jobs uh, and uh, robots cannot do these jobs. Uh, mechanics, uh, mechanical work will require humans for the foreseeable future. I'm, I'm guessing for the rest of my lifetime, at least. That's a ways off, hopefully. Uh, and you can't outsource this to China, Mexico, Canada, et cetera. Uh, you can't take what we do here and move the footprint anywhere else. It's a local job that cannot be done anywhere else. So I try to tell students when I meet them, this will be giving you a job for life with good benefits, good pay. Uh, these jobs aren't going anywhere. In fact, uh, we might need more as Madison grows as a city and our fleet gets bigger. Uh, this is also a chance for us to get minorities and women in the door. Uh, we do a lot of recruiting and it's very difficult in this area to find minorities and women to become technicians. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. A lot of it's bigger than Madison or Wisconsin. It's a societal issue that women aren't encouraged to go into this field or minorities are not encouraged to go into this field. 
And the second problem is um, they might not want to work for us for various structural, structural reasons. So we're trying to break that down. So we've had 11 students in this program since 2018. Seven of them have been minorities and women, which we're very proud of. Um, and it's, uh, I, I think I've mentioned it's been successful so far and we hope to keep going. Unfortunately, we're on a pause right now because of the COVID spike. I'm hoping to revisit this in early 2021 if things get better and there's a vaccine, et cetera. Um, here's another benefit for all of your organizations that aren't doing this. The full-time mentors, the full-time mechanics really enjoy this. So uh, we've pictured here someone named Carlos from La Follette and uh, Mike is our mechanic. He's, uh, he's up there in, in age um, and he is really enjoying mentoring uh, the students and teaching them things and uh, teaching them tricks of the trade. Um, so you know the 15 hours he spends with the apprentices during the week, he's actually enjoying its work fulfillment. So that being said, we don't force any mechanic to work with any apprentice, this is voluntary only. Um, not everyone is suited to be a mentor to high school students. Um, typically, uh, you want folks that volunteer for the role, typically their parents, they don't have to be, but typically parents do, do really well in this. And uh, so you, you're starting a bond, um, you know, even more than me as an administrator sitting upstairs. These, these guys on the floor have a bond with the students that potentially could last for a long time beyond them being with us. Um, coming back to the pipeline, we are identifying the top students to one day work for us, hopefully. And we have one who's on his way right now. Uh, one of our first apprentices who started in 2018 was a junior, he stayed with us through senior year. Now he's at MATC, he's still working with us while he's at MATC. If he graduates on time, gets good grades, good attendance at MATC, et cetera, we're planning to hire him full time uh, to get on the ladder in city of Madison government. Um, and we're hoping to do that every year, uh, to have a pipeline every year of students that matriculated graduated MATC, got their technical degree, and then they meet the minimum qualifications for working with us. Okay. And uh, something I can't reiterate enough is how much the technology changes in this field, uh, you know, month to month, year to year. Uh, I mentioned electric vehicles. We're investing heavily in electric, uh, both for economic and um, also environmental reasons. You're also seeing the beginnings of automated technology. Uh, we're piloting several autonomous types of vehicles for the city of Madison right now. Uh, there are jobs in this area. Um, a lot of folks worry about the loss of drivers, you know, if Ubers and Lyfts are automated, for example. However, there's other kinds of jobs in this area that will be created. Um, and I think we as a city need to stay on top of it and also make sure the apprenticeship program uh, is, um, is incorporating all of this new technology moving very quickly. And in fact, these high school students have a lot of technical knowledge that can help us too uh, in this area. A lot of students are on their devices and they know how to use apps and they might be uh, better at looking things up on the internet or finding diagnostic information, et cetera. So it's, uh, we learn from them too, actually. Okay, so if you would like to be successful, I think we have been. Again, I'm very disappointed that COVID is pausing this program for us. Uh, can't wait to get started back up. Um, I would recommend doing marketing. So we uh, go to every local high school that has an automotive program and present. Uh, present like I'm doing to you today here in a classroom of 25 students to talk about what we do and encourage them to apply. Um, so I am very involved along with my other managers day to day. Uh, problems crop up with high school kids, just like with any employee. Um, there can be issues, and you have to really stay on top of it, and to the degree possible, have close contact with parents and teachers to make sure that any issues that crop up, you're dealing with them quickly. Uh, we do have to remember high school students, age 16, 17, 18, they're not fully grown adults. Uh, they have their own sets of issues. Uh, that can happen in the workplace. And so we have to watch them closely. And I personally am involved in that. I mentioned only letting uh, volunteers work with them. So you don't want to force an employee to work with high school students who's not the best equipped person for that. Um, some of our mechanics um, are people who like to be by themselves in their bay all day. And that's fine. They're very good mechanics and they're not social and that's what they want to do. Those aren't the kind of people you want to force into this. Um, 
but I believe every organization will have volunteers. I, again, I think it's very fulfilling for these folks to work side by side with a young person to teach them what they know and uh, they have pride in that. Um, I mentioned uh, our relationships, so school teachers, school administrators, parents, guardians, other mentors they have. Um, we have close contact just in case we need it because the students have a support network outside of the workplace that you might need to call upon. Uh, also, we keep students on probation. What that means is they are employees at will. Uh, they don't have permanent civil service rights like our full-time employees. So that means they're employees at will and we can let them go if we really need to. Unfortunately, we've had to do that a few times uh, with serious problems. And uh, coming back to addressing issues, I can't say this enough about, you know, managing adults or, or students. Um, when something comes up, if you hear about, for example, a student having an altercation with another student in the break room, for example, uh, that's something that needs to be dealt with swiftly uh, for the program to be successful. Um, that, that was my presentation. Um, I, I'm happy to answer questions or, or um, whatever else that folks would like to talk about. I see some familiar faces here um, and some that I don't know. So I'm happy to um, answer whatever questions you might have. Um, I've been doing this for a number of years now. I did have a question, if I could. This is Tracy Griffith with Walbeck Group. Hi. Um, so I oversee our youth apprenticeship and initiatives for our company, and I sit on the state council. So I love when I see these kind of initiatives going forward. Could you just tell us um, how, how, when you're talking about your mentors, how are you matching the mentors? Because I think we all know that any success to the, the youth is, is having that right connection with the student or the, um, the worker, how are you um, picking those mentors to work with the students? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so we had, um, before we even started, we explained the program to our staff who had never done this before. And in fact, my predecessor, you know, purposely didn't want to do this uh, program, um, concerned about issues it might bring up. So. Um, we, we sat down with the folks that volunteered and went over what this program would look like and um, what the structure would look like and um, what we were holding them responsible for. So for example, uh, we could not affect the maintenance program because we're doing the apprentice program, right? So that, what that means is I didn't wanna see brakes not working out there in the field uh, during a police chase because uh, the mechanic's gonna blame that we're doing this apprenticeship program. Um, we also had another parameter that there could be a slight slowdown in um, repair turnarounds. Um, so something that let's say might take two hours. If it took two and a half hours because of the instruction and the student um, trying to um, learn, uh, we are fine with that and the city is fine with that and um, everyone involved was fine with that. But we didn't want something that should take two hours to take eight hours. Um, so it's about a reasonable, uh, it's a reasonable middle ground uh, that we're doing something different uh, has value. Um, so the, the, the folks that stepped up, we checked that they had good disciplinary records, they had good attendance records, uh, that our supervisors felt that they were very good mechanics uh, with a lot of knowledge to share. Uh, so it worked out that those that volunteered turned out to be uh, the right people for this. Um, and, and I'd like to reiterate, we didn't force anyone into it and one of the reasons we're on pause during COVID, I think this is very important, is because the mentors told us they weren't comfortable um, instructing the students, even six feet apart, um, during this period of the spike. And uh, we listened to their opinion on that. Um, and, and we had to put the pause on the program, partly so that the mentors felt safe coming to work. Um, so yeah, the, I think the bottom line is, um, Having a structure in place um, so the mentors know exactly what they're getting into, uh, watching it while the program goes along to make sure the mentors and the students are uh, within that structure and that um, there's also a YA youth apprenticeship checklist that we have for the automotive pathway, which is very helpful because the checklist um, can be given to supervisors and mentors and we can say by the end of the semester, we'd like to hit most of these checkpoints. 
Uh, so there's a lot of structure to this program from the Department of Ed, Education, MMSD, uh, that we appreciate. Does that, does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you for answering that. And, and I'm, I'm just going to chime in because, um, as I said, um, I've had a career of working with um, nonprofits, but I actually started as an apprentice. And I look back at the person who uh, took me under their wing um, and allowed me to, to learn. And it was really, really important. And now in my kind of career of youth development and youth work, I really think it's important that we realize that uh, youth learn in different ways. We have to acknowledge that youth learn in different ways and also to make the best supervisor, the relationship with the youth, we've got to understand that this, this youth has got to give, a, give the permission to the supervisor. I'm going to try and teach you. You have to allow me uh, to let you teach you, which means correct you occasionally and, and, and steer you. And, and I know through my work with, with youth work, uh, just in a culinary program, you know, if you don't have that relationship and suddenly you say, no, don't do that. Uh, a, a young person these days can take that as a real, whoa, that person came down on me, I'm not coming back tomorrow. And, and you've got to have it, it's in your own best safety and learning. Um, so it is a relationship building. And then the benefits of that are, wow, I learned more, kind of I'm really into music and youth cultures. I learned more about mods and rockers in England in the 60s from the guy who uh, was my kind of workplace mentor than I would have ever have done if I hadn't have had that relationship with him. So there are other benefits. But what I want to talk quickly about, because I'm going to try and wrap up, is, is the HR side of it. I spoke this week um, with, with the city's HR, and I'm, I'm kind of one of these employees that um, you go into your executive director, you go into HR, and and next thing you see that, that picture of the scream, oh no, it's Hugh again, he's going to ask me an impossible question, can we do something? And, and yes, because I want to make opportunities available. I'm going to ask us to kind of look outside the norm and, and try. And, and what's encouraging, HR and the city have an enormous track record of working with youth. They've had youth 16 to 18 on their payroll for many doing summer work, internships. And, and so the movement from these positions to youth apprenticeships were natural if you've got people like Mahant willing to be the champion, willing to do it. And it's really important. And HR told me just this week that if you enter it into uh, the mindset of we want to do this, we want to make it happen, you can make it happen. Youth come with a load of stereotypes and a lot of people all back off. However, if you've got a department who really want to make it happen, HR and insurance can allow um, everything to happen in a safe, supported environment. Yes, you have to run things by risk, but it can happen and you can make the opportunities um, available for young people. And then, this is what makes my work easier, when you've got a champion like Mahant, the, de the city departments, I can then go and give an example of how city are working in this way. So other kind of department heads can look, oh, let's have a look to see how they do it. And slowly, slowly increase the opportunities within the city. So whether it's engineering, whether it's IT, we have the example within the city where we're doing it, and doing it successfully and safely and create, creating, as Mahant said, that pipeline because the city really wants Madison youth to be working in the great yard jobs of Madison in all departments. So we've got to expose young people to all of the opportunities. And, and sadly, when I think about those barriers to trying to recruit the youth that we really want in them, we've got to educate the parents as well about what an apprenticeship is, what kind of the opportunities are, what are the benefits, and one of the big kind of pluses, I think, is if you look at the fear from adults of the cost of their four-year education, when you kind of combine it with uh, the benefits of a, an apprenticeship, a registered apprenticeship, or a youth apprenticeship leading to an apprenticeship, um, the cost-benefit analysis has to be brought into the conversation because four years, five years down the, 
the road when a young person is qualified, they are earning and, and working at a rate uh, which we don't often talk about. And so you've got to kind of, uh, you've got to involve the parents um, and you've got to kind of um, educate them about all of the benefits so young people can make a decision to join the program. But that's, that's, that's what I have to say. And uh, I really appreciate everybody this morning uh, who's on this call because um, we, need, we need to do more work um, telling our youth that there are fantastic possibilities to, uh, to, to go into careers uh, that can, can support very, very good wages. And as Mahant said, we need these workers in the future. So thank you. And um, I, I encourage everyone to, to, to think about apprenticeships. Mahant, Hugh, I thank you very much for your time this morning. And thank you for being such great champions for youth apprenticeship. Uh, next up, uh, we're going to hear from some people that have experience firsthand. So uh, our youth apprenticeship coordinator, Heather Jaswowski, is going to lead our alumni panel discussion. I know that Lucas is on the line. Chris, was Chris able to make it? I know that we have video of him in case he wasn't. I don't see him on yet. Okay. So Heather, I'll let you and Lucas start the conversation. And if Chris is uh, here, then he can join in. Otherwise, we have the video we can play after. So Heather, I'll let you take it away. All right. <clears throat> As Jeff has said, my name is Heather Jaswowski. I am the coordinator for the Jefferson County area. Um, I'd like to introduce Lucas Bauer. As you can see by the slide, he has his successes. I will let him go more into depth and talk about that himself, though. Um, Lucas, would you like me to go through the questions? Or I know you have them on hand. Did you just want to go ahead and uh, start the conversation? Um, either way works for me. If you want to sort of lead me in, that would be all right, so we'll start off. Uh, if you'd like to tell us about where you went to high school and when did you graduate? Sure, so um, I was a, a graduate of Jefferson High School in Jefferson, Wisconsin in 2019. So a couple of years back. Um, and uh, yeah, which is sort of out of the, out of the area that I worked in, um, a little bit farther removed. And then what was career path, uh, an area of interest that you, pres uh, excuse me, what career path or area of interest did you pursue through your YA apprenticeship program? Sure. So I was a one-year student in the biotechnology youth apprenticeship program through um, Dane County School Consortium and their uh, apprenticeship program there. Um, and uh, during that time, I worked in sort of a biotech path, um, working in both uh, lab equipment, repair, sales, things like that, as well as doing, um, uh, I guess it would be called protein chemistry, um, making tools for biotech researchers and, and professionals uh, across the country and across the world. And then what caused you to get interested in the youth apprenticeship program at your age? So I always had a, an interest in um, biology. I enjoyed my coursework um, in, in biology all throughout high school. Uh, but I knew I didn't really want to work in medicine. Um, so I thought that biotechnology would be a great opportunity to sort of explore that a little bit more outside of um, just what my uh, high school could offer me, um, being able to go out into the world, um, into industry and experience um, sort of what work in, 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 in industry is like um, versus just class. And then you previously already mentioned uh, where you did work. So how did you get involved with the company that you worked for during your youth apprenticeship? Um, so because of um, my sort of removed uh, where I was living um, was removed from the Madison area and most of the, the apprenticeships are available in Madison. Um, the uh, Jefferson County um, youth apprenticeship um, people really helped coordinate it, it um, my transition in with the company. Everything was sort of taken care of, introductions were made, and um, it ended up being a really great fit, um, even though that, that employer was sort of uh, already in the pipeline for, for me to work for. I think that brings up another good thing too, is that we are always in need of more employers in our pipeline as well. Mm -hmm. And then as far as considering going to college, did you have a career plan when we, you went to college or did you have your career plan already in place when you started your apprenticeship? Um, I, I always planned to go to um, a four-year university. Um, 
the sciences and, and working in, in sort of life sciences is sort of something that still requires a four year degree in a lot of cases, um, or at least a two year degree. Um, so it sort of, it didn't give me a broader uh, a shift in really what I wanted to do, but it helped push me towards where I ended up um, going to the university here um, and really pushed me to pursue more of a biotech side of things versus um, another major within the life sciences. Okay. And then what has been the biggest takeaway for you from the youth apprenticeship program? What, how has it helped you most in your career thus far? Um, I think that the apprenticeship program really gave me um, sort of a, a, a confidence going through and working with things. Um, in, in a lot of biotech um, situations, whether it is the, the lab equipment or, or the um, biology side of things, you're working with a lot of expensive, expensive reagents, expensive materials, um, things like that. Um, and when you're a 18 year old high school student, it, it can be a little intimidating, but um, knowing that you uh, have the skills to go in there to do a great job, get everything done, um, I think is something that's really allowed me to have the confidence to go forward and, and continue to work on um, important things uh, in, in college and, and beyond. So uh, as far as uh, graduating from high school, sorry, now you are attending college currently. Are you working anywhere that is pertaining to your former youth apprenticeship? Sure. So um, I think the, the slide uh, says something about the, the lab I work in. Um, I work in the Gilroy lab here at UW-Madison, um, which is another youth apprenticeship uh, employer through Dane County. Um, I know that last year um, I worked with one of the YAP students a little bit who was um, hired through the program and was also working in the lab. Um, so now I, I work in there doing um, plant research um, in, in terms of uh, a, a variety of things, um, particularly in, in space. So sort of a, a, a 180 from what I was working on before, working on um, lab equipment and um, research tools, uh, switching more towards a, a horticulture, applied horticulture kind of uh, situation. But um, yes, it, it is still uh, everything that I do now is is very related to what I learned, what I accomplished, what I did um, during my time in the program. Would you, would you say you had any challenges during your youth apprenticeship program? Sure. I mean, with any, with any position, there's going to be challenges, especially not having a lot of the background that people do working in in this field but um, I was very fortunate to have a mentor who was willing to um, take the time and help me figure out what I'm doing answer all my questions um, you know it's one thing to, to be learning a new skill set but it's another thing to not have um, years and years of, of scientific training behind that scientific knowledge to understand the core concepts that um, dictate the the work you're doing um, so just having a when when i was a little bit lost when i didn't know what was going on um, i had a very close relationship with my mentor and was able to get through um, just about uh, every every difficult thing um, that came my way okay and what advice would you give businesses considering sponsoring youth apprenticeships? Um, I would say that it's it's a great opportunity to um, not only give back to sort of the next generation of people working in your field or interested in your field, um, but also to get um, some very uh, high quality um, work out of a lot of people. Um, I know a lot of the people that were in um, my biotech um, youth apprenticeship class with me um, were incredibly motivated, incredibly driven um, to get things done and got a lot done um, for uh, their, their own um, mentors who they were working with. Um, in a lot of cases, people were in um, academic labs working on, on campus um, and were able to help uh, PhD candidate students um, achieve their, their doctoral degrees and, or at least simplify the process. Um, 
So I think in, in that case it can be highly beneficial just to have someone who you can teach, who can do great work and who is going to be um, really empowered by the experience to um, continue on in that path in life um, and, and make the most of that training uh, into the future. All right. And if you could, what would you change about your youth apprenticeship experience if you had the chance to do it all again? Oh, I, I don't know if there's anything I would change. Um, I think that my experience was, was so positive, having mentors who were so ready and, and willing and, and capable to teach me what I needed to know to work with me to make sure I had um, all the, the information I would need. Um, that I, I don't know if there's, there's a thing I would change. Um, I, I loved every part of the, the experience and, and uh, it's, it's paid back in dividends as I've continued on in, in my path um, in, in what I'm doing now. All right. Is there anything that I haven't asked that you'd like to add that you feel would be beneficial to speak towards as far as possible employers that are looking to bring on youth apprenticeships? Um, I think that, um, especially in a, is in a city like Madison, where biotechnology is sort of a, um, an expanding field, um, there's a lot of large firms that are um, very well established, have a long history in Madison, but then there's a lot of smaller companies who are working on a, a different projects, things like that. Um, exact Sciences is, of course, a, a big example that's come up um, recently that hiring students who are able to um, work for you to learn and, and really help build, it's going to help build up um, a bottom layer in the in industry, making sure that there are people in Madison who um, maybe they grew up here and they, they want to stay here. Um, maybe it's, it's for um, the industry across the country as a whole, but having a, a layer of people who know how to do the work that needs to be done for a lot of smaller companies who want to begin working in Madison, um, it really helps build um, a strong talent base in the city for um, now and for in the future, uh, making sure that there's um, highly capable people ready to work on uh, whatever um, sort of comes to the area or, or wants to build in the area. I, um, I didn't have any further questions for you, but I don't know if anybody in the panel, uh, if Lucas could answer any questions for any of you that might have questions. If not, I believe Josh has his video of Chris Schrader's presentation. I want to thank you, Lucas, too, for your time. Of course. Thank you for having me. So, Chris, will you tell us a little bit about what year you graduated?
So I see Josh has provided the link um, to the interview. I, I'm guessing that uh, you can access that at a later time if you wish. Is that the idea, Josh? Um, yeah, or unless one of you want to try to play it and see if it works better. It's fine. Either way. We could just move on. It's fine. Okay. Um, I apologize for the technical difficulty, but uh, we have our, our next guest in the audience and uh, here. So at this time, I'd like to introduce to you our next speaker, who is Matthew White from the Department of Workforce Development. Matt will be talking about child labor laws and what you should know as a sponsor in the Youth Apprenticeship Program. Um, Matt is the director of the Bureau of Investigations um, for Department of Workforce Development. Matt, I'll turn the floor over to you. It's all yours. Good morning. I'm going to try and share my uh, my PowerPoint here. We'll see if this works. Um, everybody see that okay? We can. Great. So uh, I'm here to give a, just a short talk about, about child labor laws in Wisconsin. Uh, I'm obviously um, sort of, uh, there are a lot of uh, exceptions to how child labor law works, uh, which is really going to be where you folks are going to be concerned because it's dealing with youth apprenticeship. You're, it's, a, it's a, an area that has a few exceptions to what the normal child labor law is. So as I go through the presentation here, you're going to see the first little bit is just sort of, I'm going to establish kind of a baseline for you know what child labor law says. Um, and then later in the presentation, you'll see we'll get into the very specific examples of how uh, it's different uh, when it concerns youth apprentices. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat function here, if I can. Um, I can get my Zoom window to come back up here. Uh, and then I will be able to, I hope, answer any questions you have as you go through. Um, Zoom is not the one I usually use though, unfortunately. So we'll see, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> All right, so child labor um, in the state of Wisconsin, it it's relates to the regulation of the employment of minors. Um, Minors are defined as those under 18 years of age, uh, and it's important to keep in mind that there are both federal and state uh, laws concerning um, the employment of minors. Uh, this is particularly important to the youth apprenticeship world because the, uh, the state and the federal law both have a list of uh, hazardous or prohibited occupations that that are not permitted to minors either of uh, within certain age ranges or just per not permitted altogether um, and so it's important when you're you know you're looking at a at a prospective youth apprenticeship you're looking at what the duties of the minor are going to be um, to just verify that both state and federal law uh, don't prohibit any of the sort of tasks or, or, or things that you're looking to have the minor do. Um, the Really the best advice I can give you on this, you know, aside from checking our website is you, you absolutely should feel free to just give us a call um, on the phone if you, if you have questions about, um, you know, whether a particular uh, issue is covered or not. Um, We can answer questions by email or phone. We have labor standards officers that are available all the time. Or, you know, I personally am happy to answer telephone calls or emails. And I, at the, you'll see at the end of this of the PowerPoint, I have my uh, my contact information as well. Uh, Wisconsin law regulates, and I this is I sort of uh, previewed this a little bit. Um, the list of prohibited work and, and occupations, hazardous orders. It also limits the hours of labor. Um, for the most part, youth apprentices, obviously 16 and 17 year olds, so the, the hours of labor limitations are going to be less important, but there are some, which I will talk about in a minute. Uh, the work permit requirement, generally speaking, in child labor um, is for minors that are under 16. Um, it's issued to the employer, um, and there are a number of exceptions, including youth apprenticeship. Um, but in the event that, uh, that such a permit is required, these are the things that are required. And I, again, I'm not gonna belabor this because it's not the most relevant part of the presentation to you folks, but uh, I just wanna set a baseline so you understand where the exceptions come into play. Generally speaking, minors can begin to work at age 14. 
Um, they can work earlier in, in certain areas, uh, as shown here, agriculture pr principally. Um, you don't see a lot of kids working as caddies on golf courses anymore. Or uh, the other one that really comes up quite a bit for us is working in a business owned by their parents. So if they're if they're under the direct supervision of their parent in a parent-owned business, that is um, that is permitted as well. Um, so hours and times of day restrictions uh, for 14 and 15 year olds, it's, it's much more restricted. It's typically during the school year, it's like three hours a day that they're permitted to work and it's between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, for all minors, uh, a minor is not permitted to work at any time when they're required to be attending instruction in their school. So, you know, prior to this crazy pandemic year, that meant if they, the hour, the school hours is when they couldn't work. Um, now, of course, you know, a lot of kids are doing virtual school. They have, you know, uh, ace, what they call asynchronous learning, meaning that the, the classes are, are recorded and so they can watch them whenever they want or they can work on their homework whenever they want. Um, so really minors can work anytime when the school is not requiring them to be online for a virtual class or for virtual discussion section or something like that. In the case of youth apprenticeship, uh, in the non-pandemic world, um, obviously there, is, uh, there are provisions for releasing the minor from school to work, and that is also permitted um, and would be permitted under the current environment as well. Okay. So, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, I, I forgot to mention on the previous screen there, um, Minor, and this, this does apply to youth apprentices, apprentices as well, uh, minors under 18 who work at least six consecutive hours must have a 30 minute meal period, um, it, unpaid 30 minute meal period. Uh, this is somewhat surprising to folks for two reasons. First of all, they, they don't realize that, you know, that this is the case, but then second of all, they, a lot of folks don't right, realize that this isn't the case for adults. So uh, there actually is no, state or federal labor law that requires uh, unpaid lunch breaks for employees working over a certain period of time. But Wisconsin law does require those for uh, employees that are under the age of 18, including for youth apprentices. So if they're going to work more than six hours in a day, they must be given a 30-minute a, a meal period, um, during which they're completely relieved of duty, they're free to leave the premises, and so forth. Uh, I basically covered this already, 16, 17 year olds can work anytime except when they're required to attend school. Um, additionally though, they if they work more than 10 hours in a single day, uh, they must receive time and a half. Uh, this is true whether or not they are going to go over the sort of 40 hours per week limit that would require overtime ordinarily. Um, so it's possible, for instance, that a, a minor employee could work a 25 hour work week, but because they worked it in two days, some of that time is going to be paid a time and a half. There are also is possible that you, that you can have weird circumstances where the minor does work 50 hours or whatever, um, and the last 10 hours are a time and a half, but also two or three hours earlier in the week have to be paid a time and a half because they went over this 10 hour period. Uh, just briefly, if uh, minors under 16, uh, three hours per day, eight hours per day on non school days. Um, I won't get into the, the differences here, but basically there's, it's a little more uh, open on summer break than it is uh, during the rest of the year. Um, here's where we start to get into more uh, things that are particular to the youth apprenticeship world. Um, prohibited employment. Generally, the Wisconsin Administrative Code or the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act will place a prohibition on a type of work or a type of machinery, not on an establishment. So it's not accurate to say minors can't work in manufacturing, for instance. Um, it's more accurate to say they can't work on machines that do X, Y, or Z, um, you, you know, because they're unsafe for whatever reason, uh, you know, it, it's, a, uh, it's a bandsaw or whatever. Uh, you, they, there are limitations on that. Um, and certain types of work as well. So like uh, you'll see 
um, roofing, for instance, is, is generally prohibited. We don't want kids working on roofs. Um, it's, it's generally speaking not safe. Although again, youth apprenticeship can be an exception to that. So the work prohibited to all minors is listed alphabetically in the administrative code. Um, some of these things are really obvious. Uh, minors can't work in coal mines. Um, they can't work with radioactive materials, uh, meat processing, uh, things like that. Uh, but I, the, the most important thing is this is a, an incredibly long piece of administrative code, both, both on the state and federal level. We have a nice web page if you go to uh, DWD work permit officer handbook, it's all sort of broken down into uh, categories. So it's, it's easier to search that way if that helps you. Um, but we, the, the uh, references to each section of the administrative code are in that work permit officer handbook. It's always important to read the section because there are exceptions and strange, um, you know, sort of caveats and things that you have to be aware of when you are evaluating whether a minor can work. And again, if you ever have questions about any of these things, I encourage you to call me, give me a phone, give me an email, whatever, uh, whatever works for you. Uh, there is also, in addition to the work that's prohibited to all minors on the previous slide, there is work that's prohibited to minors under the age of 16 only. Um, it's a broader list, obviously. We're, we're more protective of 14 and 15 year olds than we are of 16 and 17 year olds. Um, most of this not too relevant to youth apprenticeship. It's possible, I understand, that there may be some uh, youth apprentices who are in like a two year program who may start slightly before their, their 16th birthday, which is why I, I mentioned these things. Um, the restrictions are considerably more uh, intensive on, on 15 year olds than they are on older kids. So um, there are basically three exceptions to the prohibited employment. Um, and then unfortunately there are exceptions to the exceptions. Um, the, first of all, there is an, uh, an exemption for registered apprentices. This would be um, uh, not youth apprenticeship, but for, for registered apprenticeship, which is uh, the indenture rules under the chapter 106 of the statutes. Um, pretty much a, you're gonna get like a 17 year old or a 16 year old uh, in rare cases who's in one of these types of apprenticeships and they're pretty much allowed to do most of the work um, that any other apprentice would do. It's just, it's just sort of a blanket exception. Uh, for high school graduates, uh, minors who've graduated from high school or completed a GED um, can perform otherwise prohibited work. These are the things that they can't perform even if, um, even if they, you know, even if they have graduated high school. So, I mean, again, it's a lot of it's fairly obvious. Uh, coal mining, explosives, <laughs> radioactive substances. I actually used to make jokes about bakery machines because I thought that was pretty funny next to radioactive surfaces. And then I, I did a little research and discovered that they use these big industrial mixers that can rip your arm off. And that joke became a lot less funny to me. Um, but uh, just generally speaking, you know, things that can, that don't have uh, safeguards to protect the, the sort of the limbs or the life and integrity of, of the health and welfare of these kids um, may still be prohibited for high school graduates. And then there's the student learner exemption, which is the one that we probably will spend the majority of uh, our discussion on today. Um, it is uh, the one that applies to youth apprenticeship as well as to other types of uh, programs under uh, sort of an accredited school that has a work, a school to work uh, agreement of some kind. Um, a student learner is allowed to do some work that's otherwise prohibited uh, within a, when the work is within a bona fide school to work training program that's sponsored by an accredited school authorized by DPI, the Technical College System Board, or the Department's Youth Apprenticeship Program. Um, Work that's prohibited under those 270.12 to 270.13 is the things I was talking about earlier with prohibited and hazardous employment. Um, any work that's prohibited under those sections that is incidental to a student learner's training, meaning that it's, uh, it's related to what they're doing, um, and 
that it's intermittent and for short periods of time. Uh, typically under federal law, that's interpreted as 5% of, of their work time or less can be on one of these prohibited tasks. Um, as long as they're under the direct and close supervision of a qualified and experienced person, um, that safety instructions will be given by the school and correlated by the employer with on the job training, and that there's a schedule of organized and progressive work processes to be completed. This last one is referring to uh, and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the specific youth apprenticeship terminology, but there is the sort of checklist of, of tasks um, that, you know, that they, the student learner will go through showing that they have mastered various aspects of the apprenticeship program. Um, so what does all this mean? Um, oh, before I get to what all this means, these things are always prohibited to student learners. Again, it's, the, it's a lot of the obvious ones. Um, there are just certain things that are considered to be sort of too dangerous for minors to do. Um, even with these, it's possible that a minor could, for instance, um, and I'm trying to think of a good example, hoist and hoisting apparatus is probably the easiest one to, to see here. So like uh, a, a forklift or a freight elevator that a minor is not permitted to operate even under the student learner exemption, it's okay to show the minor how to use it. Um, they can observe a trained user using it from a safe distance. They just can't be actually allowed to operate the machinery where, where it fits into one of these prohibitions uh, because it is it has been deemed by uh, you know, the Wisconsin legislature, by the federal government under the FLSA, um, to be too hazardous for a minor to do, uh, hazardous to the minor, hazardous to others. Uh, these are also always prohibited uh, with, with uh, certain exceptions. Um, you know, for the most part, these are again fairly intuitive. So uh, I've I've given you a link here, and I can uh, I can provide to the organizers of the meeting today a copy of this PowerPoint so that the links are available. Um, but the Work Permit Officer Handbook is a great resource. It's got all of these uh, hazardous and prohibited occupations listed alphabetically. They have cross references to one another, and also to the administrative codes. So you can see what the code actually says about it. Um, and then the second link here is to a handout that we prepared with the youth apprenticeship folks um, who in ordinary times are kind of across the hall from us. Um, and it's a, it's a really nice guide to you know, particular types of employment, whether minors are allowed to do them generally, whether they can do them as student learners under the exemption, um, and then any, there's some notes, there's like a note section on the right side that will, um, you know, give any notes or caveats about that. These are both really great resources. And um, if you can't find your answer in these, like I said, shoot me an email. Um, I probably answer five, 10 of these inquiries per week, um, largely from youth apprenticeship folks. And that's totally fine with me. That's, um, we'd rather you got it right than guessed. Uh, so I, I'm gonna go into some specific exceptions now. Um, or talk about things that, that may fall under student learner. Um, so 16 and 17 year olds, uh, hoist and hoisting apparatus is generally prohibited to all minors. However, uh, 16 and 17 year olds can operate floor jacks, service jacks, or hand jacks. These are like pallet jacks or things that you can move, uh, move things around with. Um, some automation and signal elevators, and if you look at the code section, you can see what the rules are there. It's, it relates to the, you know, the amount of, uh, cargo or capacity that the lift has um, and lifts related uh, to repairing and servicing motor vehicles are also permitted so you know they can operate a jack for um, for changing a tire for example uh, 17 year olds may drive this is the motor vehicle outside helper and the rules for this are even more strict than student learners so if you're going to have any driving be done by a minor as part of a youth apprenticeship you'll want to consult these rules. They're a little different. Um, the driving is only occasional and incidental. In this case, that means less than 20% rather than less than 5% because that's a state law rule. Um, minors only can, 17 year olds only, can drive during daylight hours within 30 miles of the uh, minor's place of employment. Uh, the motor vehicle does not exceed 6,000 pounds gross vehicle weight, obviously has a driver's license no records of moving violations. See what I mean about there being a lot of rules to this. Um, everybody has to have seat belts and the minor must be instructed that belts must be used. Um, and 
the driving for 17 year olds cannot be towing of vehicles, can't be route delivery or sales. They can't deliver pizzas. They can't, you know, um, they can't drive to deliver newspapers even. Um, they can't work as cab drivers or, or uh, freight drivers. Really what, what this rule applies to is if um, an employer has multiple locations, for instance, or just a very large campus where driving from one place to another may be required, um, the minor can drive a vehicle with coworkers in it, up to three uh, coworkers, you know, as part of incidental to their employment as a paid duty. Um, so that's that's mostly what I have on uh, hazardous and prohibited employment, by far the biggest area for youth apprenticeship. And I'm sorry, I can't figure out how to get Zoom to show me the comment section while I'm sharing my screen. So uh, if there are any comments in the chat, I, I would appreciate if somebody would, would uh, unmute and shout at me so I can, I can stop and answer. Otherwise, I'm gonna go and uh, just talk about some of the minimum wage issues and things that, that we need to be aware of. No comments thus far, Matt. Okay, great, I appreciate that, thank you. Um, so the minimum wage rates, uh, this used to be a much bigger part of this presentation when we talk about child labor. Nowadays, you know, it's hard to even find minors to work for 725 an hour, certainly not in the, in the YA space, it's not very common at all, but just be aware the state minimum wage and federal minimum wage is 725 per hour. Um, under both state and federal law, there is this idea of an opportunity rate where people under 20, you know, you can sort of bring them on on a trial basis um, and pay an opportunity rate of 590 per hour for the first 90 days. And then on the 91st day, the rate must increase to at least 725 per hour. Um, this is obviously hardly utilized at all anymore because if you think it's hard to hire somebody at 725, try telling them they're gonna make less than six bucks an hour. Um, I wouldn't take that job. Um, oh, look, I actually cut out mostly the stuff about it. So <laughs> here's, the, here's the contact information. Feel free to contact us if you have questions. Um, in a second, I'm gonna stop the screen share and then I should be able to see the chat comments if people have them, uh, questions. But here is the uh, website address for us uh, and my email address. Um, I will provide a PDF copy of this uh, presentation to uh, the organizers of the meeting so uh, you can have the contact information, you can have the website references, you can have the handy lists that I've assembled in it. Um, and again, I, I can't emphasize enough, if you have any questions about this, it's better to just give us a call, talk to a labor standards officer, check our website, email me, whatever it is that's gonna help you, uh, you know, figure out your, your question. There, the, the thing to realize about the administrative law code that deals with hazardous and prohibited employments and with the student learner exemption is that the vast majority of it was written 20, 30, 40 years ago, and new equipment is coming along all the time that doesn't, it is not expressly identified in the code. And so what you're gonna to have to, what we have to do is really apply the existing prohibition sort of by analogy to new equipment and figure out whether it's safe enough for minors to use. Um, it's, that can be very tricky to do. So, so please don't hesitate to contact us. I have stopped the screen sharing so I can see the chat. Uh, and I, I have a couple minutes, I think maybe for questions um, or I'm happy to take them offline as well. Sure. Any questions for Matt? Seeing and hearing none. Matt, I thank you very much. I know that uh, you have a very busy schedule and I appreciate you very much coming to uh, speak with us today and being our content expert. So it's my pleasure. So thank you very much. You're more than welcome to stick around, but I know that you're busy and if you leave, we won't be offended. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, like I said, feel free to give me a call or an email if you need anything. Appreciate it. Thank you. So now I'd like to turn things over to Youth Apprenticeship Coordinator, Josh Fassel, to share with you an overview of the Youth Apprenticeship Program. Josh? Oh, Josh, you're still muted. Maybe that's why my video didn't work, I think. Uh, that's all right. Uh, because we had such excellent employer kind of background and, and some of our student spotlights, I'm gonna go a little bit faster through some of the areas um, just to give you an overview. 
I think so that people understand there are many different work-based learning programs out there. Uh, and if you've heard of co-op or an internship or work release, um, do understand that they all have different levels of school involvement and expectations. And what we would all kind of say is that youth apprenticeship is the premier one um, because it's so much more structured um, and had places higher expectations on both the school and the student uh, from an employer's perspective. Actually, I wanted to share that this starts with employers. And that's what, for me, um, as somebody who had taught for a long time, um, trying to connect the gap between education and employment, right? There's still such a huge knowledge gap between those two. Uh, we just want to make sure that people understand that this is a partnership, right? Between our high schools, our employers, and our post-secondary institutions. But look at who's at the top of that pyramid, right? It's you, the employers. And so it starts with an employer willing to hire a student. And then from there, now where, where can we support students? We have 11 program areas. And when you talk apprenticeship, people mostly talk about the trades. But as you saw from uh, Lucas, we have an amazing biotechnology program. Um, we have students, I wish I would have been able to show you Chris's. Um, he started in our IT program and he's now a, a, a mechanical engineer. Um, so fantastic, right? And to be able to take those skill sets uh, and move them along. And so we're going to talk through and show you some of these different program areas so that you can really see, okay, well, I might be a construction company, but do I have an IT need? Or I might be this type of company, but can you support a student in accounting or finance? And again, if it starts with somebody who's open to the idea, that's how we can break down some of those doors with new companies. Oh, great. Um, so speaking of technology challenges, one of the things that you think about, especially in the Madison area, right, has been if you host a hiring event, and this is your, your amount of uh, people who attend it, uh, and it's a challenge. All right, not during COVID, uh, because we're all struggling, but um, as you come back to those pieces and you're still looking for talent, um, here's a piece that could help you fill those gaps. The other part is if your workforce looks like that, um, you know, there's something to age diversity having students bring in new ideas and really help give a little bit different perspective on the ways you've been doing things as a business. I would also tell you is what a great opportunity to provide supervisory experiences for staff. If you have some budding uh, young employees who you think could become management material, what a great way to figure it out to see if they can train a youth apprentice and really mentor a student. That gap is still wide and wider than ever in our minority groups. And I will tell you that's the one piece that we are strongly focused on, trying to recruit um, minority business owners to bring in minority students into the youth apprenticeship program. In addition, we have that huge skills gap. All these students are so focused on college. And we just need to flip the script a little and say, let's focus on the career and then go to get the amount of college that you need to be successful in that career. Uh, and so really helping us flip that gap. Uh, and again, the way we do it is give students those experiences. We had an IT student, was planning to go to four-year school to get a computer science, got a job at QBE, ended up going, oh, I can become a network engineer and it's a two-year program at Madison College and then can continue on in the career path. Um, so those are ways that we can help change those directions that students understand. The other part is helping us put those pieces of the curriculum puzzle together, right? Looking at those skills checklist, as they were mentioning earlier, and really helping us make sure we define the skills that students need to be successful on the job. And then it's that pipeline. Um, as you heard earlier with our City of Madison friends, um, this is a great pipeline. So many of our students end up staying with their employers. Um, I actually have a slider. I'm going to show you that success of it. So what is a youth apprentice? Good news with our child labor laws. We don't have to worry about anything under age of 16. We don't work with students under the age of 16. Um, so junior or senior in high school, they've already started to go through the process. What do I mean? Well, this is not a student who just wants to get out of school. Yes, we have those students. Um, and that might be a reason why they got into the youth apprenticeship program. But at this point, it's really about a career path. This is a student 
who has an interest in this specific area and wants to pursue a career there, right? Think about that for most high school part-time jobs. That is not the case. We are trying and continually trying to get, encourage more students to get into these branches of areas that say, hey, work that part-time job in the career area that you're actually interested in. And we can reduce your college debt, reduce your college uh, major changes, right? And all those other more successes as they continue up in that career ladder. The other part is they're enrolled in concurrent related instruction. Sometimes that's in their school. We have fantastic finance and IT curriculum within our school districts, but not all of our schools offer health science. Ooh, I got that muted just in time. Um, so we run a CNA program for students who need extra coursework. Not all of our schools have automotive uh, labs. So we run night classes in automotive. Same thing with advanced commercial construction. So we run specific classes where our schools don't have that curriculum that are directly tied into those skills checklists to make this program really representative of the apprenticeship model. So a student has to work a minimum of 450 hours of paid occupational work experience in order to be considered a youth apprenticeship completer. That works out to about 10 to 15 hours a week during the school year, and most students might work 20 or so hours a week in the summer. So I'm an employer, what do I have to do to get involved? Well, here's the good news. You still get the interview applicants. We're going to send you referrals, we're gonna send you student resumes, and we're gonna ask the employer to look at them as, is this a student you would consider to hire? Once you decide to hire a student, we ask you to provide a mentor who will support and guide. Uh, and you had some really good tips and tricks on how to assign those mentors um, who, are, who would be a good fit for a student. We ask that you provide a well-rounded experience. Uh, so many employers know now that we need to coach students in, and I think that's a very different mindset than where we were 15 years ago, where it was, hey, let's see if you can handle this, right? Even in college, right? If you're a business major in college, what's the class they use to get rid of business majors? Accounting. We're gonna make this class so hard so that all these kids will drop this major and see who can cut it. It's a different mindset. Um, we wanna provide them an experience to coach them into the industry so they can find which is the right area for them. The student says, oh, I wanna be an electrician. Do they really know what that means versus working in concrete, versus working in carpentry, or ver versus working on HVAC, right? And so really helping them see those different areas um, even though they think they have an intended career path. Provide that competitive wage. Um, I always laugh when we talk about $7.25 an hour. Um, our average wage right now is almost $12 an hour for youth apprenticeship students um, in the Dane County area. And that continues to go up just due to demand. I have some students in our healthcare and they're making $17 an hour. It's like, wow, that is amazing. Way better than my three fifty dollars when I uh, was in high school. And then have available that 15 to 20 hours uh, in your schedule for those students to work. Um, it's a little bit more of a challenge right now with us in, in COVID and school schedules. Um, we normally can get really big chunks of release time for students, but with the way they've all gone virtual, sometimes it's a little bit more of a challenge. But if you have the hours available, our students will find a way uh, to work those hours. So again, employer driven. We're going to give you referrals uh, and contacts of students um, and we can go from there. Wow. This is just fantastic. Um, Well, I'm gonna show you the checklist off of our website because uh, this slideshow is not working. So they, as they mentioned earlier, they have a very specific set of skills that students need to develop on the job site. 
And that's what makes youth apprenticeship a little bit different than some of the other areas. Um, we're often in a co-op, we can teach it to a student in the class and they can do some things on the job site. And so that's more of a basic introductory, um, hey, let's make sure we're building how, you know, learning how to show up on time and, and, and go to work. Uh, but when you get into a youth apprenticeship, there are very specific skill sets that students need to do on the job site. So we talk about uh, IT. And they used to call these checklists, and the state is currently in the middle of a modernization as we move from checklists to job guides. But there are different pathways that students can complete in employers. Uh, so IT essential is what we would often call help desk support. Uh, we have hardware, software, and a web and digital unit. And then within each of those areas, they have the specific set of skills. Now all 16 of these items have to be completed uh, for the student uh, on the job site. Now in this case, they allow four of these competencies to com be completed in simulation. So since we know that nobody really ghosts a computer anymore, um, that process of imaging is the same concept. But if, you, if they can't do one of these, in this case, they can have four of them be done in their related instruction and then all the rest have to be done on the job site. But they're written pretty broadly so that it can be applied to your specific industry area. Just wanted to show you as the state has continued to kind of progress these checklists into now job guides, this year they added IT broadband. We are currently working right now with Mount Horeb Telephone Company to bring on a student in the broadband area. So we're, we're really looking forward uh, to that opportunity. Um, so they actually reached out to our office and said, hey, we wanna bring a student on. Uh, we created a posting. And because we didn't know students knew about this, we don't have a list of students who are already looking to be broadband technicians. So now we're going into our school and searching for a student. And that's where this partnership really helps. You can reach out to all of the different schools as you'd like if you're trying to reach out to high school students and they're gonna create general job postings. But we're trying to go find a youth apprentice who's going to fit this role. We're going to go into those specific classrooms, whether it's tech ed or the computer science classes and talk to the teachers and say, do you have a student who wants to work and is interested in this field? So now we're, we're really helping pull in a specific student that would be a really good fit for a position. In the new job guides, they've changed it so you can see those, those skill sets that have to be done right on the front page. So it makes it a little bit easier as an employer. Also, as an employer, some people will go, well, what does evaluate a work order mean? How do I rate them in a three, two, or one? Well, the nice thing is they've now, oops, skip that part. given you 10 or more extra bullets that explain what is evaluate a work order, right? And so you can really help see, all right, have they done all of these things? And this is the student's responsibility to be able to learn and continue to ask for those pieces. What we ask the employers is to provide the opportunity to hit, to hit the numbers and then allow the students to kind of dig deeper in those bullet areas. One other piece is the related instruction. Um, and in our area, oh, let me see if I can find this properly. Um, again, we offer those courses. So in, in if we're going from an IT perspective, um, we have a bunch of courses that we recommend students participate in. And so in our area, if we go into information technology, I don't run separate courses. And that's because our school has those opportunities for students. Oh. So 
So we have, as a consortium, set some kind of expectations with students and said, okay, schools, if you want to place a student in a specific uh, youth apprenticeship program area, these are the specific courses that directly align to what that student is doing. So if I was to go down to IT now and go, okay, in that student pathway, we want to make sure students are taking or have taken um, AP Computer Science, Game Development, Project Lead the Way, Computer Essentials. They have some of our uh, schools have cybersecurity courses now. We also then recommend that they take the A plus computer hardware and software programming at Madison College. We also have some partnerships with Herzing University where they can take programming logic, computer networks, and computer architecture courses. So those are the advanced courses that our students are taking while participating in the Youth Apprenticeship Program. And that's true for every one of our 11 areas of the Youth Apprenticeship piece. I'm not sure this is going to work, but I wanted to at least share it. So um, we went out and recorded a video for our friends uh, with QBE. They've been doing youth apprenticeship since I believe 1999 and have taken one or two IT students every year. And so I have a video here, I'm not going to share it um, just for, out of time, but we went out to QBE and recorded this video. and. When we were there, five of our former youth apprenticeship students were actually at work and it was just accidental. Um, and so we took a picture and then I was like, well, how does YA work and, and is it really working? And as we started to look back on it, these are all of the IT students who have been employed at QBE over the last 10 to 15 years. All of the ones in blue, are still employed at QBE. All of the ones in gray, look at their job titles of where they're at now. Every one of them is still in the industry in some fashion, right? So it works as a great way to help them find their path. That means these are students who didn't have to change their major in college were able to go to school for what they needed. They built those work skills while in high school and while in college and were ready to hit the ground running as soon as they left uh, their education path. All right, we'll see if we can get beyond this. And I believe, Jeff, that's all I have. Well, thank you, Josh, I appreciate it. Um, next we have, uh, our business services very own Jeff Kennedy, who is an apprenticeship navigator, along with Milton Rogers, who is the apprenticeship training representative for our area. So with that, gentlemen, I'll let you take it away. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, as Jeff said, my name is Jeff Kennedy. I'm an apprenticeship navigator. Um, I like to say uh, my, me and Milton are partners. We're conduits. We're collaborators between all partners involved in this. Um, so what I'd like to do is give a little bit of a kind of brief, um, broad overview of benefits of YA. And then Milton's gonna take it away after that. He's gonna discuss uh, bridging YA to registered apprenticeship. So youth apprenticeship allows the student to use skills learned in the classroom in the workforce setting. Um, youth using this knowledge in real, excuse me, real world employment settings can generate light bulb moments for the students. So these revelations, they open up possibilities of where the position could lead in the future. It also helps the student formulate long-term career plans. Ideally, this would encourage the student to continue their path into a registered apprenticeship and eventually earning journeyman or journey person status. Um, youth apprenticeship programs contribute to robust internal talent pools of experienced employees who are part of the team, they're immersed in company culture, and they're dedicated to positive, positive business outcomes. Youth Apprentice uh, understands what's involved to advance in their position and within the company. And they're, they're also committed to this positive growth. So studies show that for every dollar spent on apprenticeships, employers receive an average return of $1.47 in increased productivity, reduced waste, and greater innovation. 
not to mention higher rates of retention and advancement throughout the company. Registered apprenticeship continues the learning journey and contributes to long-term investment in the employee. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I will pass it over to my co-presenter, Milton, and he'll explain a little bit about bridging uh, YA to registered apprenticeships and how that can benefit companies. All righty, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, I'm hoping that there are still employers here in this meeting that train youth apprentices, um, but that don't train registered apprentices, apprenticeship, apprentices yet, uh, because I'd like to hear from you specifically after uh, I kind of give you a little bit more info. Uh, but when we're talking about bridging, what we really mean is providing uh, a legitimate post-secondary opportunity for youth, right? Traditionally, you could go into the military, you could go get a four-year college degree, or you can get a technical diploma. Uh, all of those things are valid and they can work. In fact, I would submit that they provide a real potential for legitimate career pathways. However, the difference when you add in youth apprenticeship bridging into registered apprenticeship, what you create is a tangible career pathway. And that's the distinction I'd like to make. That's what we're emphasizing here when we talk about youth apprenticeships and registered apprenticeships. We're really talking about the tangibility um, of an individual to feel, to smell, to see, to interact with their career pathway. That's why I think youth apprenticeship is so great because the pathway starts with exploration, figuring out what you're good at and how to be good at things, learning how to show up to work on time, and getting your hands a little bit uh, dirty and doing some of these occupations you thought you might be interested in. But when you move over into registered apprenticeship, now the pathway becomes more defined, uh, more specific. And for those parents out there uh, who fear that their child may not get the appropriate education if they just go to work right away, I'd like to just share that uh, a vast majority of our apprentices do receive credentials in specific um, occupations, licensing in specific occupations, and uh, a healthy number of them receive 39 credits towards an associate degree, and they can, in effect, take a few additional courses and complete their apprenticeship and an associate's degree in parallel. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things associated with youth apprenticeship and registered apprenticeship. And I guess the last thing I'll say about the bridge, what that really means is those employers who have youth apprenticeship programs, meaning they allow individuals to explore occupations, those same employers have a pathway for those individuals to enter into a specific and defined registered apprenticeship program to aid in their post-secondary um, education uh, and, and also incentivize those individuals to continue in that career pathway. Uh, that's really all I have to say about that. It's not overly complex, but uh, I think the issue surrounding that is really just education and having a conversation with employers uh, and asking those questions does it does it make sense for me as an employer to have a registered apprenticeship program and a youth apprenticeship program and how do i specifically bridge the two so if there are questions i'm definitely open to hearing them are there any questions for milton or jeff before uh we move on to the tips um I'm just gonna show this quickly. Just to show these are students who've been there for a very long time. So I think it's that really that long-term investment, um, but it's really a short-term investment for a long-term gain. Um, to take a high school youth um, and spend the year with them, and that's, you know, cost $5,000 about. Um, and there is productivity, right? As you heard from Lucas, like they are doing a lot of research and a lot of support and they are fairly productive. Are they as productive as you would like a brand new employee to be? Probably not, because they take a little bit more coaching and molding. 
but the look at the long term, right? These are students who are still there for 14 years, right? And are still employed at the company. That is fantastic. Um, and so the other part is we've actually had students who graduated, went to another company, and then went back to uh, the employer as part of that program. So, all right, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. No, you're fine. I, I think that uh, retention is one of the lesser known benefits of uh, using apprenticeship as a, a model for bringing talent into your pipeline. Um, we've seen study after study that shows that turnover is less with apprentices than it is with employees that you would hire from other means. So uh, point well taken, thank you. Um, well, with that said, uh, we'll, we'll move on. So the next uh, item on our agenda is recruiting students. Um, and Jen Wegner, who is a YA coordinator with us with the Madison Metropolitan School District, will now discuss how and when to recruit. Jen? Um, good morning, everyone. Happy to see everyone um, this morning. So my piece here is just very short and sweet, um, but there are um, best times to connect um, our students with potential job opportunities, potential youth apprenticeship opportunities. We can work with employers any time of the year. However, because students need to be in their regular high school classes and or connected to that related coursework that Josh was mentioning earlier, we need to ensure that we're working around students' schedules and some times of the year are easier to do that than others. So for example, working with you around April and May to solidify an opportunity um, and to do the interview processes for a June start uh, for students that may um, be going into a summer uh, start for their youth apprenticeship. Um, so the best time to start that would be April or May. Um, also working in July um, for an August or a, a very late August, very early September start. So it's the beginning of the school year. Um, so student schedules again can be set to ensure that they have the time set aside um, for their high school coursework, their related coursework for youth apprenticeship and time to work um, for you. And then finally, um, again, best time is November, December for a uh, mid to late January start depending upon um, a school district's semester to uh, t uh, timeline. But again, we can work with you at any given point in time. If you have opportunities that are popping up, uh, just know that uh, as we work with students, sometimes their schedules are a little easier to work with um, than others. Um, but again, we'll work with you at any point in time. So thank you. Thanks, Jen. Um, I believe that's the end of our presentation. Unless anyone has anything else, uh, I'll ask my YA coordinator team uh, if you have any other comments that you'd like to make before we close. Seeing and hearing none, I'll guess that we covered all that ground. Um, so I just wanna say thank you on behalf of the Youth Apprenticeship Consortium for our region. Um, we really appreciate your time and your participation today. Uh, I would be remiss, however, if I didn't uh, acknowledge our, our guest speakers and thank them as well. Hugh Wing, Mahanth Joyce, uh, Matt White, Jeff Kennedy, and Milton Rogers. Um, I'm very grateful to our alumni speaker, Lucas Bauer, who made time for us today, and Chris Schrader for making time um, to join us by video. Um, again, Josh provided that link. It's in the chat if you'd like to watch that. Um, another fine young man and a great uh, testimony to the program and the success of the program. And then I'd also like to thank our youth apprenticeship coordinators, Josh Fassel. Jen Wagner, Heather Jaslowski, Cindy Sandberg, and my teammate Aaron Beshin here at the board. So thank you very much, and I appreciate your interest in sponsoring Youth Apprentices. Uh, feel free to contact any of us if you'd like more information. And with that, I will wish you a wonderful day. If you have any questions, we can entertain them now. Um, but otherwise, thank you. And hearing no questions, I will say that concludes our day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.